Welcome back to the History Obscura Reading Room. I am your host, Mandy Gardner. I assume you're here for tonight's tea and a story? Excellent. Your timing is perfect. I've just succeeded in getting the mailman to settle down in his new enclosure in plenty of time for his... transformation. I rather need a good hot brew. <sniffs> The specific story I want to tell you tonight is about the bizarre journey of a dead man's bones. But first, I need to tell you about the man himself. Our tale begins, once upon a time, in the year 891, when an ongoing feud between the Spolito family and the newly named Pope Formosus began its most deadly chapter. Then, as now, the Pope lived in Rome, which was one of the most important cities in the Holy Roman Empire. The same year that Formosus was made Pope, Guy II of Spoleto was named Emperor of the Romans. The Spoleto family and Formosus were at harsh political odds much of which had to do with the fact that the Spoleto Emperor was more interested in expanding the Kingdom of Francia than he was in protecting the sovereignty and authority of the Holy Roman Empire. Pope Formosus was singularly loyal to the Empire, while Guy II of Spoleto was focused on victory and glory in the name of his French ancestor, King Charles the Great, also known as Charlemagne. In fact, ten years prior to his appointment as Holy Roman Emperor, Guy II had actively supported his family in waging war upon the Papal States, in which lay the city of Rome. They were successful in reforming the Duchy of Spoleto thus separating it from the Empire for the first time in a century. As a result, the Papal States were greatly diminished and put at a large disadvantage in terms of political clout and military might. Despite an obvious feud with the Spolitos, the old papacy was forced to forgive the transgressions of Guy II in exchange for its own safety. Furthermore, a confusing mesh of political rivalries and alliances meant that Guy II himself was made emperor thanks to his friendship with Pope Stephen V. Once Guy III had achieved emperorship, he saw to it that his son, Lambert II, was created King of Italy and co-emperor of the Romans. It was, therefore, that Pope Formosus, the star of this story, had no choice but to crown the Spolito father and son joint emperors on the 30th of April in the year 892. It was a successful arrangement in that the Spolitos thereby agreed to return all territories their family had stripped from the papal lands. Pope Formosus, however, still distrusted the ruling family. Determined to remove Guy III and Lambert II from power, the Pope looked for an ally to help him have them deposed. He needed someone powerful, someone who could command an army and win. He chose Arnulf of Carinthia to assist him in carrying out a coup. Arnulf had recently been elected King of East Francia and had long served as the leader of a small duchy in southern Austria. King Arnulf had an excellent history of military conquest, notably having recently led a decisive victory against Viking raiders at the Dial River north of Brussels. What probably made him all the more attractive a prospect to Pope Formosus was the fact that King Arnulf had deposed his uncle, Charles the Fat, from the East Francia throne 
following Charles' assistance to the Spolitos. Believing Arnulf to be the ideal choice for co-conspirator, Pope Formosus sent an embassy to his home in Regensburg. The offer was enticing. Formosus's messengers told Arnulf that if only he could raise an army to liberate Italy from the rule of the Spolitos, then Formosus himself would meet Arnulf in Rome and name him Emperor of the Romans. Arnulf thought this was sufficient motivation to do just that, and so in the year 894, the king of East Francia sent his son Zwentibold to invade Italy. The invasion force routed Guy III from the city of Trent, where another ruler was quickly installed. Successful in his first endeavors, Zwentibold pulled his troops back into East Francia later the same year to rest his army, which was riddled with sickness. Something unexpected happened next, however. Emperor Guy III died while hiding out with his own army along the river Taro. Pope Formosus urged his ally not to let the opportunity pass, and Arnulf duly led the army back over the Alps and into Rome in 895. The capital city was seized by the invading army. Believing his plot to be complete, Pope Formosus declared Emperor Lambert II formally deposed. King Arnulf was crowned Emperor of the Romans by the Pope at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome on February 22, 896. Unfortunately, soon afterwards, Emperor Arnulf was struck by a sickness that paralyzed him, causing him to return abruptly to East Francia to try to recover. His plans to physically rout the deposed Emperor Lambert II from Italy had to be put off, which left his own title in some jeopardy. To make the entire matter much worse, Pope Formosus died on April 4th of the very same year, leaving two contending emperors behind to sort the mess out for themselves. As the only contender actually present within Italy, it was Lambert II who ultimately held his position as Emperor of the Romans. In the year 897, Lambert personally traveled to Rome with some of his most important supporters to have his title reconfirmed by the new Pope, Stephen VI. It's worth mentioning that Stephen VI came to be Pope only after the death of Formosus's first replacement, Boniface VI. Boniface died 16 days after his succession from symptoms that may point to poisoning. With his ally, Stephen VI, installed as Pope, Lambert II had an obscene demand to make of him. It turned out Lambert II was not satisfied merely to reclaim his authority over the Holy Roman Empire and let sleeping popes lie. Thirsty for vengeance, Lambert ordered Pope Stephen VI to exhume the body of Pope Formosus from his grave, dress him accordingly in papal robes, and seat him in a chair within St. Peter's Basilica. What followed became known as the Cadaver Synod, the formal Catholic trial of an eight-month-old corpse. There were several charges brought up against Pope Formosus, who sat somewhat stiffly in his chair and appeared to hear nothing. Some of the charges had to do with technical requirements of Catholic authorities. For example, the accusation that Formosus had illegally moved from Porto to Rome while keeping his bishop's title. That was probably not the reason the Pope's body had been wrenched forth from the grave, however. The trial's true purpose, of course, was to charge the former Pope with crowning an illegitimate descendant of Charlemagne as Emperor of the Romans. 
while the existing emperor still lived and ruled. Lambert and the rest of the Spoleton family was outraged at the events that had taken place in Rome, and they sought not only to cement Lambert's authority in Italy and the entire empire, but to scare the hell out of any remaining supporters of King Arnulf and Pope Formosus. A deacon was even chosen to speak for the corpse, so that when Stephen VI asked Formosus questions, they would not go unanswered. After several accusations, the dead pope was found guilty of his charges. Stephen annulled the defendant's papal service and declared all of his acts and holy orders null and void. Interestingly, Pope Stephen VI himself had illegally transferred from Anagni to Rome while serving as bishop. Furthermore, it had been Pope Formosus who had created him a bishop in the first place. So, in annulling all Formosus's acts, Stephen VI undid his own bishopry and therefore could not be charged for the same crime for which he charged the corpse. As punishment for his crimes, Stephen VI cut off three fingers from Formosus's right hand, which he had formerly used to perform consecrations. The deposed pope was then undressed from his holy papal vestments and reburied without ceremony in a graveyard for foreigners. Unsatisfied at this last fact, however, angry pro spoletans unearthed Formosus once again and dragged the body, supposedly naked, though surely just bones by that time, through the streets of Rome before throwing it into the river Tiber. There were repercussions for many of the people involved in the hideous cadaver synod, particularly Pope Stephen VI. It seems that when the body of Pope Formosus washed up on shore further down the Tiber, the body began performing miracles. Gathering an even greater popularity among the local Romans than before his death, Formosus inspired his faction to rise up against the Pope who had convicted his bones. This faction of rebels stripped Stephen VI of his title and threw him into prison. Stephen died in his cell, having been strangled. Romanus replaced Stephen as Pope, but his reign only lasted until December, when he was deposed and replaced by Theodore II. Pope Theodore II died just 20 days later. It was just enough time to have the body of his predecessor, Formosus, recovered from the riverbed and reburied respectfully at St. Peter's Basilica. He also annulled the entire cadaver synod, legally undoing anything that had been proclaimed there. In 898, following two investigatory synods, Pope John IX had the documents of the cadaver synod destroyed and excommunicated seven cardinals who had taken part in the corpse trial. These same synods prohibited any future trial of a corpse. And yet, during the 10th century rule of Pope Sergius III, another synod was held at which the legislation of the cadaver synod was once more affirmed. Sergius also made sure to restore the ruined Lateran Basilica, which had been destroyed by an earthquake while Formosus' bones had sat on trial. That's all for tonight, friends! Do remember to check out our page at patreon.com forward slash history obscura. Sign up there for ad-free episodes, extra bedtime stories, and more! Good night.